If you've ever wanted to change the future through the scientifically proven power of your mind, then do we have the Real Magic Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Dean Radin, Chief Scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, author and co-author of over 250 technical and popular articles, three dozen book chapters or more, three books including the award-winning The Conscious Universe and Tangled Mind, the 2014 Silver Nautilus Book Award winner, Supernormal, and his latest, another all-time favorite of mine, Real Magic. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about the scientifically proven power of our minds to create our futures, our realities, and our planet. That, plus we'll talk with him about a disturbance in the force, Anima Mundi, Zener diodes and quantum noise generators, levitating robot wizards, transmuting chocolate donuts, the danger of three wishes, gotcha, robot f <laughs> wizard Armageddon's, oh my god, and what in the world multicolored carnivorous flowers have to do with anything. So welcome back to the show, Dean. Are you ready to shine? I believe I am shining, yes. Woohoo! So, all right, I didn't know I was going to go there this early, but what did you learn from the 2016 U.S. elections? So, for many years, we've been uh, testing a hypothesis. The hypothesis is that mind and matter are very tightly correlated with each other. Mm -hmm. and the metaphor I use is that mind and matter are like two sides of the same coin. So if something happens on the mind side of the coin, then something correspondingly has to happen on the other side, on the matter side. Yep. So to test that hypothesis, we uh, have both looked at small group effects like, like uh, meditations in groups and people going to a movie theater and sports games and so on yep. as a way of manipulating what is happening to the collective mind. So the minds become coherent when they're all attending to the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then on the matter side, we, we needed something that we can measure that would change in correlation to this modulation of attention. So in principle, everything would change. Like literally everything changes when you get a group of people attending to something because the mind side changes. The matter has to change. The thing is, though, that we're not ma measuring matter all the time. We need something that we can measure automatically, continually, collect data all the time. And in addition, that would show periods of coherence versus non-coherence. So what we came up with, and not just me, but my colleagues around the world have been doing this for a while, we used electronic random number generators yeah. uh, and other forms of electronic equipment that produces random noise or system, random systems. And the reason is that if coherence develops in a random system, you can detect that immediately using statistics. You can see that order is appearing where it shouldn't appear. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to see. So in the vicinity of small groups and sports games and so on, we would put random number generators and we were able to track when something excited it happened that pulled everybody's attention, we would see a change in the random numbers. So about 100 experiments of this type have been done by lots of people around the world. Then we created a worldwide version of and, this. And called, if I interrupt for, for a brief moment, statistical significance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Overall, the preponderance of all of these studies very clearly shows that, that our original hypothesis is correct, that there's a tight correlation between focused minds or coherent minds and the change of the physical world, at least as far as we can measure within the random number generators. So in the last presidential election, there was a lot of attention being paid to who was going to win the presidential election. Mm -hmm. uh, as the news uh, went over the course of the day, of the election day, it started out pretty much with one candidate probably winning. And then as it approached the end of the day where all the votes were coming in, it was flipping and it flipped hard so that the other candidate won. So we were monitoring... In, in our our system, we were actually across the street from uh, the Skywalker Ranch, which so is so appropriate. Yeah, because that's of course where Obi Wan is talking about a disturbance in the Force. So we were near the Skywalker Ranch. We had our devices running, and we saw that within a couple of minutes of the final uh, results being announced, that we saw what amounts to a ripple in space time. 
a warping of space-time as reflected in the quantum noise that we were measuring. And we've since done a number of other studies using the same equipment, uh, generally mostly at Burning Man for a couple of years in a row. Yeah. Uh, and again, seeing something that looks a lot like a disturbance in the force. So we're continuing to do experiments in the same vein to uh, both refine the hardware that we're using and to, to develop new measures. So the first global experiment is called the Global Consciousness Project, and we're now working on GCP2. GCP2 will have thousands of random generators around the world, whereas the first one had, on average, about 60. So so let's blow this out for a minute. And for some reason, what's stuck in my head is is rallies. And there was there was a political rally uh, by the president recent, recently that didn't go so well. But now I'm starting to understand maybe the power of rallies, which is if you get enough focus on one intention, on one idea by a large group of people, it can actually start maybe a brush fire that grows from there because of that focused attention. Right. So what is relevant to this idea is that when you look at the Global Consciousness Project, that was, that's was that been running for 23 years now, continuously. The formal experiment involved 500 events. Mm -hmm. So 500 events over 23 years, these were all big things that attracted tens of millions of people. Not, not rallies, really, but just events that occurred that, you know, the media pulls all the attention. The result of those 500 events, we look at the, at the data, which should be random, but it wasn't random. It was seven standard deviations from chance. So that's associated with odds against chance of three trillion to one. And what that tells us is that when you have a big event that draws a lot of mind together, it does change the physical world. Something happened to the world in order to create this, this effect. What it doesn't say, though, is that well over 98% of the 23 years of data, we we had not attached to any event. It's just running all the time. But there are events happening constantly, like a rally with the president does, like a meditation group down the street. All kinds of things are happening constantly. And when you look at the data over long term, it's a random walk. You know, you get these little ripples. Sometimes it's a big ripple. Sometimes it's a small ripple. Sometimes it's up. Sometimes it's down. So I, I got curious about this and wondered, well, we, have, we haven't looked at 98% of the data. What if we start looking at these little ripples? And there's two things you can do then. One is you could look at a, a ripple or a, or a random walk that deviated and say, I wonder what happened on that day. Yeah. So you can go back and you can start doing that. But then it's a little bit it, – it's not as valid scientifically because it's like shoehorning – the data to try to find something yep. and and maybe it was like the precursor to Chinese New Year's and it wasn't a big thing but there was a kind of a small effect going on which might not even be f discoverable in the news or maybe it was it was a, a meeting or something something happened when you build out this story what it amounts to is that what we see as a random walk may not be random it may be that we're seeing the physical world getting modulated by lots and lots of events having to do with consciousness. So sometimes there are a large group with focused consciousness. Maybe one person mm -hmm. with the right kind of focused awareness can actually cause a ripple that, that covers the earth and beyond. So the bottom line is that Albert Einstein did not like quantum mechanics because Spooky quantum mechanics – distance. And, and he used the phrase, God does not play dice. Yeah, because quantum mechanics says that ultimately at the bottom of everything is fundamental randomness. There's no cause for why things happen. That has become imbued within the the scientific worldview. That's simply part of the way that we think about the world now. There is every, at bottom everything is random. There is no cause, which ultimately means there's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's no anything else. It's a nihilistic philosophy. That's not why Einstein didn't like it. But nevertheless, it's one of the consequences. And what, what I think we're beginning to see then is when we track these very long-term random systems that they're not behaving randomly, suggesting that there are causes. We still don't know what most of them are, but maybe Einstein was right. And in fact, God or whatever you think of the universe is not playing dice. There really is some kind of order underneath it all. 
So, so if we blow that out, and then I want to get to how we can do something with this, what you're talking about, for lack of another way to put it, an informed field of energy. All of this has information and has meaning behind it. I would say there's structure or order behind it. Whether it has meaning, meaning is something that we imbue. Yeah. So, so I don't know if it has meaning or not. But but structure or order or even cause, right? Because like when you're when you're deep down into the quantum world, there is no cause of anything anymore. That's why Einstein was bothered with this. Especially, a lot of physicists are bothered by the idea. A lot of people too, that something happens with no cause at all. Mm-hmm. Right, we are, our brain sort of reacts against that. What do you mean? There's no cause. It's not that you don't know. It's not that you're ignorant of the cause, but that there's no cause even in principle. That's where we we find trouble grasping that idea. So maybe we we are looking at a cause. We, it could be beyond our conception, but there is something behind it, pushing the world as we see it, and of relevance to our discussion, at least some of that seems to have to do with consciousness. Well, you say that the challenge was rooted, the challenge of, of the, 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 the chaos, the everything that's going on today. Uh, you say at the beginning of the book, the challenge was rooted in humanity's faulty understanding of consciousness. And that's what's gotten us here today. What does that mean? That means if you take today's understanding of consciousness, it is either a meaningless side effect of the processing of the brain, an epiphenomenon, which has no meaning at all, it's just there somehow, uh, or it is wrapped into the fabric of reality. Mm-hmm. It's, it's simply that's simply there, it's part of, of how the fabric of reality is created, uh, but doesn't necessarily have any intrinsic meaning to it, it's just, it's like electrons, it's simply there. So if we don't and we don't yet understand exactly what consciousness is or where it arises from or what it can do, by not understanding that, we, we're more or less uh, in the position of somebody who's striving to achieve something without knowing what the goal is, which has a number of problems. One is you never know if you reach the goal because you didn't have one. And the other is it's never quite clear what direction to go because you're, you're kinda, you get pulled all over the place all the time. So we're kind of in that position today with not truly understanding what the nature of consciousness is or what it can do. It almost sounds like the protest, which are extremely important, but I'm watching over time and I know they're going to morph and change. It's almost like a, a, a an old Boeing jet trying to get to the destination, going, going from one beacon to another, to another, to another, to another. We're, we're moving like a flock of birds more and more, aren't we? Certainly, that's that's what you see with protests, right? People, people, we are social animals. We get drawn into our anger and our frustration get, gets drawn by others, mm-hmm. and we want to participate in it. And and it does have effects. I mean, these protests. There's a long history of it in our country and other countries that sufficiently long-held, large enough protests will change society. Mm-hmm. It does happen. So it's not simply a matter of expressing frustration, it, it can move the needle, essentially. Can we use what you've been learning, and, and, and maybe we, should, we get to go back to basics on, on your research here, but can we use this reverse engineer, okay, we are affecting, we are warping or bending space and time, which has really interesting ramifications for space-time travel, but that's a whole other story. If we are, are, are bending or changing the fabric of reality, it's an interesting way to put it. Can we reverse engineer it to use intention to shift where we want things to go as a person and as a collective? Uh, I think we probably can. Most of the experiments looking at the effects of mass consciousness have only paid attention to attention. Simply the, uh, as though you can make a picture in your head of the direction of everybody's attention and it's kind of going all over the place all the time, something happens and all of those little arrows start pointing in the same direction. So that's a coherence, at least of attention, but not of intention. So the next step would be to do a large-scale experiment or something having to do with intention. So one possible example was during Apollo 13. 
So the fact that the astronauts were able to return to the Earth is like a miracle. Uh, but there were tens of millions of people who were not only attending but intending that they would be able to be – they would be safe. They would come home. So there's a case where some kind of coherence is generated mentally with an arrow of, of a direction. It's not simply looking at it but looking with intention. Maybe that made a difference. Uh, it's difficult to get a lot of people to not only attend at the same time but to hold the same intention. Both of those are difficult. To do, to, I mean either one is difficult. Difficult to do both at the same time is extremely difficult. You need some kind of event like Apollo 13 in order to make it happen. If we go, thank you. If we go into, let's go into the science of parapsychology for a minute, and then we can maybe bring it back into this group intention. You looked at at least six key areas where there was a uh, statistical relevance. I think it was called Six Sigma. W what were you finding? And then we'll we'll look at at, at maybe a few key areas here. Six Sigma refers to uh, the likelihood of something happening by chance to be beyond a billion to one. So it's used in the uh, industrial processes as a threshold for uh, how reliable a product should be. So most computers today are w way beyond Six Sigma. Like you would be not very happy if your computer kept crashing all the time. Yeah. And, and so they're built to be very reliable and redundant and so far beyond Six Sigma level. Uh, Six Sigma when applied to experiments means we can have pretty high confidence that the effect that we're measuring is real. And real in the scientific terms means that it is independently repeated by lots of people over time. And so the, the Six Sigma areas include things like telepathy. So telepathy experiments have been run for now for maybe 60 years with a more or less standard way of doing the telepathy tests. Uh, they've closed all of the experimental loopholes that people have been able to think of as criticisms of the methods, and you still get the same results. So we have very high uh, confidence that something like telepathy, at least as seen in the laboratory, is a real thing. We don't know how it works, those, that's not been the, uh, the emphasis on the research. Most of the emphasis on all of these areas is, does it exist? Or so-called proof-oriented experiments. So we know that telepathy exists. We know that clairvoyance exists mm -hmm. in, in the form typically called remote viewing, but it's exactly the same as clairvoyance. And, and remote viewing is something I, I watched CIA, uh, a training from a CIA instructor maybe 10 or 20 years ago, this is something that was studied by the military. Right. Yeah. The uh, esp espionage, ESPionage, yeah. uh, psychic spying. Yeah. It, it's because it, it's a real phenomenon. And for people who are talented, they can get real information that is useful for intelligence purposes. Uh, but of course... Research and application of clairvoyance has been going on as long as we have recorded history. Uh, it's basically what the oracle at Delphi was doing in Greece for almost a thousand years and lots of other examples. So clairvoyance exists. Clairvoyance is a method of perceiving through space and time. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly we think of remote viewing as perceiving through space, but it also is about time. And then there's a whole separate body of research on precognition – where you can perceive what is about to happen, either consciously or unconsciously. Yeah. And then there's, uh, we have confidence, but less confidence overall on mind-matter interactions, psychokinetic effects, yeah. so mentally influencing the world at large. So since we have a little bit less confidence in that domain, mm -hmm. it means that the confidence that we have in perceptual psi, by which I mean telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, is really, really good. We basically, as close as science can demonstrate anything, those are real phenomena. It's interesting because you'll have articles from Wired and, and from who knows what saying that studies, please forgive me because I'm, I'm with you on this, yep. but they, they're saying that, that studies aren't repeatable, nobody's been able to repeat it yet, or we're getting the first studies, but who's to say what's going to come of this, as if this whole body of knowledge has not existed. For now, you're closing, and you're talking about, uh, in the U.S., close to 90 years. Right. 
And so just to give one example of what happens here, uh, my colleague uh, Daryl Bem from Cornell University came up with a type of precognition experiment, uh, got very good results, published it in a very prominent journal. Mm -hmm. A lot of people was very were outraged that he would that the journal would publish such a thing. But fortunately, it stimulated a lot of people to try to replicate the study because he had designed it in a way that all you needed was a, a PC and the right kind of software, and then you could try it. So the early reports, a few of the replications failed. Mm -hmm. and these were immediately published, and then the news media picked it up and said, well, you know, it was a mistake. It didn't, not really real. Meanwhile, a total of 90 replications have been done. And when you do a meta-analysis, you're asking, well, maybe occasionally something, one of the experiments won't work, but some of them will work. What happens when you look at the whole body of replicated experiments? Does it work? The answer was very clearly yes. It does work on average when many people, many different people try this experiment. So Daryl and his colleagues wanted to publish that meta-analysis, and Daryl has had been publishing experiments in prominent psychology journals for 50 years, and not one of them would publish that meta-analysis. And yet this is exactly what was being called for when the, when the data was first presented. Yeah. Well, let's, let's hold back our opinion about whether this is real until we get replications. Well, here they are, 90 replications, all of them published, the effect is real, nobody would publish it. So he finally got found a an online place to publish a peer-reviewed article, which it is. It's out there, and you can find it. Uh, and what it shows is something that I, I had to learn the hard way early on, which is that science is a uh, consensual agreement. It's an agreement among your peers, and your peers could be defined as very broad includes people who actually don't know what you're doing. Hmm. And so if something, if you have a lot of evidence for something and it doesn't get into journals, that immediately raises a red flag and says, why, well, why is it not getting into, into prominent journals? Especially when the evidence is very clear. It's because the consensus is that this is the way the world works. If evidence comes along saying that's not the way the world works, you simply ignore it. And so this is, it's just human behavior. That's, that's what we always do. We, we ignore the things that make us uncomfortable. And then when a science writer comes along and says, yeah, we don't know if this stuff is real, probably isn't. It's, it, there has been fraud. Uh, so well, what do we do with all that? And the answer is you ignore it. And so we unfortunately persist with a myth, or an incorrect myth, for very many, many years. Thank you. So let's let's dive into some of the key areas that we know have uh, a, a powerful effect on things when we look at intention, which you're saying is slightly less statistically uh, proven than these six sigma areas that you're talking about. But you said of the different intentional strategies participants used in the random number generator studies, the most successful in terms of their performance were in decreasing order resonance. And I want to ask about that. Asking entities, I've got to ask about that, using emotion to help power the will, one-point concentration, physical relaxation, visual imagery, and finally talking to the random number generator, good random number generator, as if it's a sentient creature. So let's take a few of these. What is resonance and how can we use that? So that refers to the idea that uh, you and the object are one. Mm -hmm like a, a typical meditation approach, that you, you reduce the illusion of separation between you and the object that you're interested in. Uh, if you are successful at it, then there, in, at least subjectively, it doesn't feel like much of a difference between you and it. Mm -hmm. So in that state, somehow it seems to stimulate the idea that you internally want something. Well, now the object wants something too, because you're not separate anymore. So that seems to be the most successful method, and incidentally, that is essentially the method used in all of the cities of, of yoga fame. The cities are the, the powers that have developed as a result of yoga practice, and in most cases, the cities involve becoming one with the object of your attention, whether it's a symbol or an object or a person or, or whatever. 
it's the reason that you gain the power is because you and it become one. And it apparently is true even with things like random number generators and other stuff. If we focus on, for instance, the news and something we don't want too much, where we're so worried that it's going to happen, is that in a sense resonance, but not in the direction that we desire? A case can be made, yes. That, that what you attend to, you draw to you, whether you like it or not. So I don't know, I'm trying to think if there are any experiments that have been done along those lines. I guess the closest that we can see are in cases with uh, random number generators, for example, some people will systematically get results that are opposite to what their intention is. Yeah. And you see this more or less across the board in many different kinds of psi tests where people get psi missing. Mm -hmm. So rather than getting the result that they're aiming for, they get a, the exact opposite result, but not just by chance, but significantly opposite. So the way that this is often described is that unconsciously, you actually don't want what you're wishing for. Because the, these kinds of phenomena all are bubbling up from the unconscious. Yeah. And so you may consciously want this, but unconsciously you get defeated. You defeat yourself. And, of course, it being an unconscious uh, override, you, you, by definition, don't have control over it. It is an unconscious thing. And we don't need psychotherapy and neuroscience to, to tell us that we're always being pushed by our unconscious. All we need to do is, is look at... Uh, how people eat, and how much we are influenced by advertising to see that your unconscious is overriding most of your conscious wishes. This is going to get into a whole other area. Forgive me. It goes back maybe to global coherence, but I see humanity. I see us each as a cells, as, as, as part of the organism, part of the whole of what I call the human beingness. Or another basic way to describe it is a bush with individual rose flowers on it. We're each a rose on the bush. But I see with what's going on in the world today that there is there is maybe some coherence, but there also is we are very much bringing about what we don't desire because there is a subconscious ebb and flow going on in the human beingness. In this one human being, we have a subconscious that we have to deal with right now. Right. On an individual basis and on a societal basis and on a global basis. It's true. Yeah, I mean, we don't normally think of a societal unconscious mm -hmm. influence, but it's there just as much as it is in, a, in the case of an individual, probably even more powerful. So on a positive note, what is effortlessly striving? Because when I do coaching of somebody, I'm trying to work with them to get them into a state of coherence or what I call flow. So what's effortless striving? Effortless striving is the, the goal in meditation where you, you must... You must attack the practice as though it is the most important thing that you will ever do in your life yeah. with complete effort and yet with no striving underneath it. So it's a paradox. Yeah. It's, it's the sense of absolute focus, absolute wanting something without wanting it at all. And so because it's a paradox, it sounds from a naive perspective that that's impossible except that after you do meditation for a while, you realize that, that is exactly the way that it works. You can have simultaneously an extreme desire or focus for something, but without the anxiety that usually comes along with that effort. You have both at the same time. I can demonstrate that very easily here. I really want a good interview with you, Dean, and I want it with everything that I've got. But if I actually focus on wanting the interview during the interview, the interview is going to blow up. Instead, I have to completely let go of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Let's go from there. Let's talk about, I, I, and you said in, in uh, maybe the, the term wasn't statistical relevance, but in, in terms of power, first off, resonance, but second, right behind it, the power of asking entities for assistance. Right. Because it is oftentimes easier to imagine that uh, things happen outside of yourself. So if you imagine that you, you can speak to your secret spirit or you speak to a deity or you speak to something else, they can intervene on your behalf. 
in which case they are all powerful, or at least more powerful than you are. And if you ask in a polite enough way, then okay, they'll do you a favor, and they can they can do all kinds of things. So it's like the basis of ritual magic is all about this. It's asking for favors where you hope that you have pleased them in some way, but they're powerful enough to be able to do what you wish. And so this works on on many, many different scales. It could be the scale of I'm asking the universe at large to do something, or I'm asking this little little sprite or spirit to do something on my behalf. And it would work just as well if you're trying to influence a random number generator. Simply say, well, okay, I know that there are little invisible creatures out there. Uh, Could you do me a favor? And maybe they'll help you. And it's you found it's statistically significant. Right. So some people are very effective in using that method. I tend to think of it in terms of, of a psychological way mm-hmm. of effortless striving. Because now it's not you doing it anymore. You don't need the anxiety of yourself. Yeah. It's simply asking very calmly and nicely, you know, would you, powerful thing, would do this on my behalf? As opposed to, I'm going to force this. I am going to force this. It's a different psychological uh, state. And it almost doesn't matter. Actually, it doesn't matter at all whether there is some external thing helping you. It's more about the attitude that you bring to the task at hand. We're really learning here. And and you talk about a future time where uh, aliens, if we want to call them that, are able to travel. They won't need propulsion. They won't need anything. They will just use the power of their mind to basically create a wrinkle in time, so to speak, Mm -hmm. Um, and, and bend time. That's what we're talking about is we have a lot more power here than we could possibly realize, don't we? If we understand the nature of consciousness, our relationship to it, like we feel like we're consciously aware so something about that awareness is probably much more fundamental and therefore powerful than we know. And so the signs that we see, the, the, the inklings that we get that what I just said is true, are first of all, from shamanism to today, that story is part of the whole esoteric literature. That's what it's all about. What we see in the laboratory and parapsychological studies confirms that we have at least a little bit of ability to do all kinds of strange things. We can see through space and time. Maybe we can cause wrinkles in space time with our intention. They're all relatively small in terms of, I think, when we get a grasp, a better idea of what is going on, what is consciousness, what is our relationship to it, and so on. Uh, it's, well, there's a flip side to this. We're talking about something which is way more powerful than than understanding the the nucleus of the atom, for example. So when we gained uh, some understanding of how atoms work, we're able to make atomic bombs out of that. That's not a very nice use of it, but nevertheless, that shows that we discovered something about the natural world, and we decided, as a species, we're going to use it in various ways. You could use it to make electricity, you can use it in medicine, or you can use it to blow things up. If we understand consciousness to the same extent, even a little bit better than we currently understand how we use it is then up to us and so if you take a large view of this and assume that the intelligent that intelligence is saturated within the universe mm-hmm. whether there are multiverses or not at least within our universe the likelihood that there are other highly intelligent creatures out there probably more intelligent than us and have been around a lot longer is basically certain simply from based on statistics yeah. in which case They may have gone through a similar evolution as we have and eventually bumping up against the question of what is consciousness, what can it do? They're likely way ahead of us on that scale. They may have learned if they were able to get to that point because you could also have a species that makes itself go extinct. So assume that they've gone past that stage and they're no longer adolescents. They may be able to tell that there are species on the cusp of beginning to learn what, what is actually happening with consciousness. And because it, it has power associated with it, power to create and manipulate and destroy, maybe they, they watch it carefully, the same way we would watch a child playing with a firecracker. Like, you know, don't light that, Johnny. Don't put that in your <laughs> mouth. That's not a good thing to do. And maybe they intervene. Right. I mean, this is like a science fiction scenario, but it's one that is not that far off from, I think, plausible. 
And so some of this brings in, of course, the whole idea about UFOs and ETs and that whole line of research. Finally, the government admits that, yeah, there's UFOs and we don't completely understand what they are. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's a reflection of the monitors. We're being monitored to see whether or not we're mature enough to allow this species to continue because once they have the hand on the on this level of power, they could be a danger to everyone. I, I've had uh, shamanic ceremonies, you know, drums, ayahuasca, the works. Can't believe I'm going to share this here, but in in it was my second or third journey, and and to me these are uh, first off, if anybody thinks that ayahuasca is a recreational drug, go to pull out your car and drive it over your foot that's more recreational <laughs> secondly it's it's not i don't believe it's visions created by the mind i was asking for for connection with something greater than myself something outside of myself and one of the beings that came to me was a father with his two kids that came out of a little little spacecraft and said that if you look up anywhere in the sky You'll see layer after layer after layer after layer after layer after layer after layer of us stacked on top of each other to keep humanity from blowing themselves up. And he said, it's a very thankless job, but we're here to help humanity during this time of their evolution. Who knows? There you go. Yep. So I've heard that story in many, many different contexts and many different ways, but all with pretty much the same kind of idea. Yeah, and the, no different than what we do as adults when we watch children, right? So the, the idea that something like that would resonate uh, throughout the universe at all different levels of intelligence kind of makes sense. We, we, I mean, at our stage, we can't prove that it's happening, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if that is actually what was going on. So where do we go from here as individuals and as a species if we start to understand that we have this power, you call it real magic in your book, and I cannot recommend everybody enough to get real magic, and we'll give links and stuff in a little bit. But if we start to understand that there is a science that proves that we have some power other than just this materialistic world that we've been taught, how do we start to use it? And right now, this is such a, I'm going to call it positively energy-infused world, meaning it is, it is, to me, it is the chaos of an electron vibrating right before a state change. Could go either way. But how do we start to use this to shift things where we would desire, which I guess is loaded as well because it depends on where we want to go with things. Well, I think we're, we're seeing it happen now. If we have uh, rallies and we have marches and we have protests, uh, that's what changes society. It's a, a very pragmatic and mundane approach. Yeah. Ones that are a little bit uh, more on the metaphysical side is, does it matter if you have a whole bunch of people that are intently praying or intending mm -hmm. for some outcome? The answer is it probably does matter. It's not simply a matter of feeling good about it. Uh, or just having fun getting together with other people, but it does cause change in the world. Uh, at this point, it's relatively subtle change, but subtle changes are not fantasy. They're real, and they accumulate over time. One of the issues then is how much, you know, if, if you have half of the world uh, intending this and the other half intending that in two different directions, it'll probably cancel each other out. In which case, you just create a kind of a foaming of intention and nothing nothing happens. If there is something that can pull everybody together so that, that the intention is pushing in one direction, the likelihood of actual movement is much, much higher. How we do that on a global scale, that's a very tough question. We, I mean, we already see worldwide that some company, some, some uh, countries are doing extremely well within the country – usually because the government is has people in it who are pulling everyone together, which is why it's so important to have someone who is a unifying force in the government. Uh, other countries where the, it, it's the design of the government or the people is such that they're, they're trying to create chaos almost guarantees that, that nothing interesting is going to happen because it, gets, it polarizes everything immediately. 
So let's go from chronic optimism. We've got to cover one or two more topics real quickly here. Uh, we ended our last talk with this. We have to uh, make sure we cover this in detail right now. Blessing chocolate. Last time we talked about blessing chocolate donuts. I need to know because there's a real power, isn't there, by putting out this energy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this was partially stimulated by talking to chefs mm -hmm. who claim that uh, if they were cooking for people in a happy state, then the compliments they got back were much, much greater and more frequent than if they happened to be cooking in an angry state, which is why they strive to have a happy kitchen. Not just them, but everybody else working in the kitchen. Uh, and so we that's what led to that experiment where we, we had chocolate blessed and then controlled chocolate that was not blessed and measured the mood of people who were eating that chocolate. So that found us a statistically significant difference in the direction that we, we thought we might find. And we since went on to study a similar effect in tea, in oolong tea that had been blessed. And then later did an experiment involving the growth of plants because we wanted to get away from subjective measures and into objective measures. We found that blessed water made plants grow better, quite significantly better. We just recently finished a replication of that and again got similar results. Uh, so it, it looks like these relatively small effects that we see with, with fancy equipment like random number generators translates into the real world with things that people drink and eat. And it matches a very large folklore, uh, both of, from, from chefs and also in a lot of religious ceremonies where food and drink play a, a, an important role. So if you're going to eat the chocolate donut, it, it would behoove you to cast positive intentions into the chocolate donut because in general, a chocolate donut is not the greatest thing for you, but maybe you can make it slightly better by by infusing it with this idea of positivity. Woohoo! Do you believe we can use something like this at this time of a global pandemic? And as they're saying in the U.S., we haven't really ended wave number one, and now we're we're on a it appears to be unfortunately a rocket ship at the moment. Can we change the virus or the outcome with our minds? I think we probably can, but unless we know what we're doing, we might end up turning it into something which is worse than what we currently have. So this is, again, having to do with the nature of the power that we're talking about. If we, we actually have the power to manipulate space and time, we can have the power to manipulate events and how they, they turn out. Uh, you don't want to give a lot of power to a little kid because they don't know what they're doing with it. And in this case, we, I mean, if we were very clear about it, we we're going to turn a coronavirus into something that is good for us and that we actually would like to have it. Even then, the long-term consequences of something, it's, there are many, many parables and fairy tales written on this general idea. I will give you three wishes. You can have anything that you want. Oh, boy. <laughs> if you're not careful, you will get exactly what you want, but it has consequences that you did not want. So... So yes, I think collectively, there's the, both from a psychological perspective, if you believe that you're, you're stronger and healthier, then your immune system is going to work better. That part's almost for sure. Mm -hmm. If you believe that a mutation of the coronavirus is now it's going to be less, than, less lethal or, or easier to deal with than a common cold, which is possible, it might have a, a side effect. And, and so I, I'm in favor of certainly the uh, boosting one's immu immune system mm -hmm. through belief, but I'm not so sure I'm wise enough to know how to mutate something because I don't know what the consequences would be. I call that the drought effect, which is if you're praying for rain here, where's the rain coming from? Right. Yeah. Where are you taking it from? Yeah. This is a little bit different because a mutation can and will happen all by itself. And unless there is no randomness and it's happening because of cosmic ray from Pluto. Uh, but to intentionally change something yeah. requires a certain degree of wisdom on what you're actually doing. So until we have that, I'm, I'm reluctant to play that game. Is there 
couple last things here. Is there an intention that you would put out into the universe around the virus at this time, rather than a specific toward the virus? Well, I tend to take the long-term view. Yeah. And so I would say uh, an intention would be that uh, whatever is going on now will be beneficial for the evolution of humanity. Now, that could you could spin out many different ways that that, that could happen. Mm -hmm. One possibility, for example, is that uh, Homo sapiens is simply too adolescent, and so we need to become Homo superior or something like that. Well, how do you get there? How do you get from one to the other? Typically, in order to get a big change like that, you need a crisis. Something big has to change. And you can even think of it as ev evolution is really good when there's pressure. It will change things quickly. Mm -hmm. So we may be faced with a pressure that will cause maybe not us, but maybe our children or grandchildren to evolve into somewhat different kinds of humans. Maybe humans that are immune to all kinds of things. Yeah. Or maybe ones that are smarter and can figure out what to do in these kinds of cases or more mature or something like that. So a, a change in humanity over a couple of generations is, is extremely fast in the, in the long-term uh, view. Maybe the, that, that would be the best for everyone. I like it. I always, I say that we can't change. We as humans, we're amazingly resilient when faced with challenge, but we're not very good on the couch. So I always say, may it be for our highest good and the highest good of all in the kindest, gentlest, <laughs> easiest fashion possible. Yes. Yes. What are you most interested in right now, Dean? What's, what's excited you or are you liking that you're playing with right now? Uh, one of the projects that we're working on uh, we call SciGenes, yeah. and this is looking at the possibility of folklore that's been around forever that some people who are psychic, who come from psychic families mm -hmm. where other people have, have the similar skills, uh, maybe there's a genetic component to that. And so over the last couple of years, we've been take, taking the DNA of, of psychics from psychic families, and we vet the psychics so that we know that they're, they're not just telling tales. They actually yeah. have some talent. And then we find uh, age and gender matched controls, which is actually more difficult to find. You, these are people who yeah. claim no psychic abilities from families that have no psychic stories or anything. So we look at, at what's called the cases and the controls. Mm -hmm. They have their their DNA. We've looked at the uh, at their sequence, and we found something. We found something in what is sometimes called the junk DNA. Yeah, it's the portion of the DNA that doesn't code for proteins, which which the amount of DNA that codes for proteins, which is what we're we're composed of, is a very small percentage, mm -hmm. something like four or five percent. But the vast majority is called junk because we don't know what it's for. Well, we may have found something that it what it is for. There's yeah. a certain sequence called an intron sequence, uh, which we find in the psychics from psychic families that you don't find in controls. And so this is exciting for a couple of reasons. One is it says there may be a genetic basis for this kind of talent because it is a sort of talent. Once you find a sequence, you, you what you're generally looking at is the tip of an iceberg. It's like the, we see a particular intron sequence, which is not coding for your proteins, but it's there. Uh, it's not a particularly rare thing. I mean, it's a lot of people have this, uh, but it's, it, I'm saying that it's probably the tip of an iceberg because it expresses in some people. It's an epi epigenetic expression mm -hmm. in some people, but in not in others. And some people don't have this at all. They don't have that sequence at all. Yeah. So it suggests two things. One is that you possibly can come up with either a pharmaceutical or some other method in order to cause it to express, mm -hmm. in which case you've created a psytropic. It's like taking the, the psychic side of psychedelics with all, without all the distortions and all the rest of it, and you just take this pill and now you're a super psychic, something like that. And the flip side, which is that you have somebody who has an uncontrolled psychic ability, which is driving them crazy, and turning it off. So you, or you tune it down. So in both cases, that would be useful therapeutically. It would be use, very useful from a scientific perspective. I mean, if you get a, a bunch of scientists and you tune them up so they're suddenly all psychic, 
that's probably a good thing. You're going to be able to make better decisions and so on. So that's one of the more exciting projects that I'm working on right now. That is absolutely fascinating, and it goes along with what you were talking about about a generation or two from now, because maybe we're going to go through an epigenetic shift where the kids are more awake, they are more aware, they understand that we are all one, and and I don't know if it's a choice or if it's just a way of beingness. It's it's sort of like uh, Roger Bannister in the Four Minute Mile. Once it was broken, it became relatively <laughs> much easier. Yeah. Once we realize what we're capable of, the new gen goes, oh, well, we can all do that then. Right. Yeah. So a lot of it has to do with belief, mm-hmm. like what, what is possible. Uh, it, maybe if we come up with a, a woke pill, you know, you, <laughs> you take the pill and now you're, you've waken up, you wake up. Uh, I, I see that almost within reach now. We have the capacity to do that. Uh, this is all about uh, neurogenetic engineering. Mm-hmm. So that's genetically engineering the whole nervous system or portions of the nervous system, including the brain. And uh, one of the companies that I, I work for now is actually doing that. It's wow. a neurogenetic engineering company that is targeting Alzheimer's and uh, dementia as mm-hmm. the first treatments. Um, because th- those are both neurological problems, essentially. And if you can tweak it uh, with g- genetic engineering, which we have the tools now that are quite good to do that, uh, you may be able to not necessarily reverse Alzheimer's, but you can restore the sense of self that, that is missing from an Alzheimer's patient, which was, among other reasons, why it's such a tragic disease. Yeah. That the, the, the idea of the person goes away so if we can restore some sense of self and something about memory and cognitive capacity, that would be a great boon all by itself. I couldn't agree more. Before I let you go, are you interested, concerned, excited about, or neutral AI and potential singularity at some point? Yes. All of you above. <laughs> uh, we're in the so-called uh, second great rush of excitement about AI. Mm-hmm. When I was going to graduate school, we were in the midst of the first great rush where we mm-hmm. thought robots would be with us in 10 years. Uh, I think now the second rush is finding that uh, because of in better tools and computers and all that, uh, we're getting a lot better at it. We can make pretty good robots now. Mm-hmm. Will we ever reach the point where the robots uh, will take over? or will will become as intelligent as us through generalized AI? Uh, I think in some respects, probably yes. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot of effort, a lot of money being put into that, and it's getting better and better. A lot of it has to do with computing ability. When we get desktop quantum computers, all bets are off, just from the, the nature of the speed and the calculations that it can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so possibly, yeah, possibly. Uh, would such creatures, if we can call it that, would, it gain, would they gain consciousness or would they have the appearance of consciousness? That's a really interesting question. And in a sense, it, it's like the Turing test, right? Is, is that machine really a creature or not? Uh, Alan Turing, when he came up with the Turing test, said there's only one way to know if the thing on the other side of the screen is a conscious creature or not. And that's is if it has telepathy. So he's talking about, I mean, the, the, this is Turing talking about this, that if a conscious system, regardless of whatever, whatever the substrate is, if it gains to the point where it has some control over its consciousness, mm-hmm. including things like telepathy, which is now a interconnected form of consciousness, uh, then we can be reasonably sure that it is, in fact, a conscious creature. And so we have some ideas about how to test for telepathy. And I think when we get to the point where we're wondering whether the Terminator scenario is about to unfold, uh, we start doing telepathy tests with our artificial intelligence. And if it passes, go ahead. You know, <laughs> They're going to be faster and smarter than us in a lot of ways mm-hmm. and have some degree of consciousness, which we hope also includes conscience. Compassion, for instance. Yes, we hope it includes all of that, but we we don't know. So that's why I'm I'm optimistic about that. 
there are some dangers. There are unintended consequences that happen with any large-scale change like this. Uh, and we'll see. Stay tuned. On that note, where can people go to find out more, Dean, and to find your beautiful books? Well, you can go to noetic.org, first of all, because that's that's where I primarily work. That's the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Mm-hmm. You can go to uh, deanradin.org or deanradin.com. You'll end up in the same spot, which is more of my personal website where you can find out about my book, Real Magic, and the other books. Uh, shortly, I will have a link to a questionnaire that we're putting together on magical practice. Ooh, so cool. we, you don't usually hear about it very much, but there are a lot of people who are doing traditional ceremonial magic and other forms of magical practice for real around the world, lots of them, probably tens of thousands. Very little is known, partially because there tend to be secret societies, Mm -hmm. but little is known about what practices the people actually use and why do they think that they're effective. So I have links into some of these networks and we're going to try to find out, uh, probably anonymously, of what what do people actually use in magical practice? How do they know that it works? And eventually come up with uh, perhaps a book on practical magic. Like what, what to do, why to do it, how to do it, and uh, what's, what's the downside if there is any. So then any last words, and this has been phenomenal, Dean. I, I love, love, love what you're doing. And, and I think it's so important because if we're going to make this leap, then a lot of us have to be able to get out of our prefrontal lobe, so to speak. Yeah, although <laughs> you, you should like your prefrontal lobes. You should good, like them a lot. Yes. <laughs> yes. Any last words of wisdom you'd like to share? And are you optimistic right now? As I said, I'm chronically optimistic. It's it's simply part of my predilection Mm -hmm. because the flip side of it is just so depressing. (laughs) I think about being a chronic pessimist. Really? No. I think it's always better to be optimistic. I mean, we know it actually even from a health perspective, it's, it's healthier to be optimistic, but not to the point of being delusional. Yes. So there's some, there's some middle ground in there and I try to, to walk that middle ground. Uh, I would say that uh, my last uh, parting wisdom is that if you haven't tried a recumbent tricycle, you should try it. It's a lot of fun. And we'll have to tie that into another future discussion, but that does sound rather cool. Two wheels in front, one wheel on back, lean to the side at high speed, and Mm -hmm. scoot along like a couch at 20 miles an hour. That's That's a lot. It feels like a reclining chair that just happens to be moving down the street. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So on that note, for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get real magic, and begin using your magic to change the future and change the world today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Dean. If you're watching this, then you are a light worker. You're a light warrior, and I want to help. We offer everything from boot camps, mini masterclasses, full-on masterminds, and private one-on-one coaching with me. To find out more about our upcoming courses, simply visit inspirenationuniversity.com or click on the links below. And to find out more about coaching, simply visit inspirenationshow.com backslash coaching. We also have weekly YouTube live events with me where you can ask me your questions live and YouTube premieres featuring me and our guest. Simply subscribe below and click on the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows. I just had a phenomenal time and space-bending interview with Dean Radin on Real Magic. To check out more incredible intention-setting interviews and time and space-warping ones, click here, subscribe below, click on the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows, YouTube premieres, and lives. Definitely check out our boot camps and mini masterclasses with the link below along with Coaching With Me. And above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! Love you guys.